Francis Lee. I'm co-director of the Philip Tatey Center. And uh, welcome to Creativity in Jazz Improvisation. And this inaugurates a whole new music program we will be having at the Philip Tatey Center this year, which is actually rather intense. And it's involved, we are involved with an organization called the Music of the Spheres Society. And we will be doing a lot of work in classical music and in music and mathematics and a whole series of uh, round tables and discussions and demonstrations around that. And we do hope to have more jazz uh, this year uh, too. Uh, I'm now proud to introduce our two musicians. Jane Ira Bloom is a soprano saxophonist, composer, and a pioneer in the use of live electronics and movement in jazz. She is the winner of the 2007 Guggenheim Fellowship in Music Composition, the 2007 Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Award for Lifetime Service to Jazz, the Jazz Journalists Association Award, and the Downbeat International Critics Poll for Soprano Saxophone, and the Charlie Parker Fellowship in Jazz Innovation. Bloom was the first musician commissioned by the, by the NASA Art Program and has an asteroid named in her honor by the International Astronomical Union. Right. We hope that she'll eventually get a planet, but that's <laughs> working her way up. She's working her way she up. She has received numerous commissions compo composing for the American Composers Orchestra, the St. Luke's Chamber Ensemble, and the Palabolas Dance Theater, integrating jazz performers in new settings. She has recorded and produced 13 albums of her music and holds degrees from Yale University and the Yale School of Music. Bloom is currently on the faculty of the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music in New York City. Dr. Lewis Porter is a jazz pianist, author, and educator. He is a professor of music at Rutgers University in Newark, where he is the founding director of the master's program in jazz history and research. He is the author, excuse me, or co-author of six books, including the acclaimed study, John Coltrane, His Life and Music. He has written numerous articles and liner notes and edits a book series and a scholarly journal. He has performed recently with such artists as Wycliffe Gordon, Ravi Coltrane, Joe Morris, and is currently rehearsing Indian influenced music as part of a new group with Badal Roy, Vic Uris, and a Veena player from South India. Is Veena, is that the right pronunciation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. His new CD recorded live at Siena Jazz is Italian Encounter. And I can't really, I have had trouble with this, but it's at altreesuoni.com and iTunes, I can pronounce. His full schedule and extended audio clips are available at lewisporter.com. So thank you very much for coming today, and we greatly await your discussion of performance. for the day is what did we just do and why <laughs> and how well we picked that one it was a piece called dreaming in the present tense uh, which was a, a composition of mine uh, which I wrote very much inspired by thinking about Freud's interpretation of dreams and I just thought it very appropriate to start <laughs> off in the psychoanalytic center to start with that um, 
But what uh, did we have to work with there? What was improvised and what wasn't? And what was creative about it and what wasn't creative about it? Well, if I were to show people what was written, and you can see it, a um, series of, of voicings that Lewis was playing on the piano. So, for example, the first one is... However, what I was doing wasn't written down. <laughs> it was based on the harmonies that uh, I heard inside those voicings. Uh, and although there is a melody that goes through this piece, it's only that I'm touching on it. Okay. Mm. A melody uh, suggested by the chords, you mean? That b the bass line. Oh, and the bass line. Is okay. the melody. Right, okay. Slow as it is. <laughs> So the topic for today is uh, <laughs> improvisation and creativity. And our idea in terms of a way to address that is to show you some different kinds of uh, improvisational things that we do. You know, They're not necessarily all of them. Most of them are not standard jazz improvisation things, but I do have that blues piece, I guess. Yeah, that that's would do, about is more, the most standard thing that we're doing today. And uh, is there anything, by the way, that to start right off, uh, we'd like to involve you. Is there anything you wanted to know about that piece we just played? Yeah. While you were listening yeah, Francis. To it? Why, why the interpretation of the dreams? How, how can you possibly translate? Is it a reaction to the interpretation of the dreams? Or is there something actually that you, some aspect of the interpretation of the dreams, a passage of land that inspired them? Now, this comes to a very difficult place yeah. where a question is being asked about a composer's titles. <laughs> Uh, jazz musicians are notoriously uh, uncomfortable about talking about those, the very thing that you're asking about the same way that poets are, <laughs> Michael, uh, to explain their titles. And I'm one of them. I think John Coltrane was another. Yeah, that's right. Is it true? He liked to write poems. Yeah. Um, when do you Often I sit at the piano. Uh, piano is actually my very first instrument. And often ideas come to me there. Um, how do they? Stravinsky wrote at the piano. <laughs> right, yeah. Some people don't, you know, and, and I am a saxophone player, so it is a little bit odd. Um, but that's where uh, I think it's the place where I, I feel the most relaxed in terms of letting my imagination go. Maybe in part because it's not the instrument you perform on, so you can kind of just try different things out, you know. But the piano is, not to be biased, you know, but it is what a lot of people use for composing because you can just kind of find sounds. Oh, that sounds good. Let me work with that, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that it was only really the piano part that was written down mm -hmm. and that you heard the melody mm -hmm. within the piano part and went off from there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to my ear, mm -hmm. what you were playing, though, was very complete for a piece of improvisation. In other words, it had a lot of depth and continuity to it. My question would be, mm -hmm. is if what you were playing was written down, mm -hmm. would someone who really knew music be able to connect what you were playing with the heart of those, of the piano piece that was written down initially? I, I believe so, I because, so. Yes. because we don't talk about it, but we're internalizing harmonic areas that the, the chords uh, indicate. And you have to remember, I wrote them. Okay. Right. Well, you wrote the chords. No, no, no. So she knows I, them very well. You know them. <laughs> right. But what you were playing, yeah. that wasn't written down. No. no. <clears throat> right. Okay. But if they did it again, she did it again, mm -hmm. we just the same question. No, we're going to do that uh, um, with a lot of these Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, because part of our, what we want to illustrate today, I guess, is, um, it, is that, uh, 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 well, I like to say it this way, that, no, that human behavior is not random. People talk about free improvisation sometimes. They go, oh, well, that's random. I say, no, excuse me. If you want something random, program your computer to generate some random numbers. Humans can't even generate random numbers. 
That's why we don't use humans to do that, because you say one number, then that has an association for the next one, and so forth and so forth. Nothing we do is random. And in the same way, when we're improvising, uh, most jazz performances, that are, especially ones that are more traditional, will have uh, something sp very specific that they're improvising based on. So even in this case, we have this series of chords by Jane. Uh, and, and even if there's not, we could do, if we want to later, just a totally free improvisation. Mm -hmm. Which, But even that doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean random. It simply means that one of us, depending which of us starts playing first, the other will respond to that in this kind of spiraling give and take starts to, starts to proceed. So we, that's one of the, I think, one of the things we want you to understand today is that um, there is this perception, this common perception out there that somehow improvisation is random or that it just comes from the air, but it actually comes from experience. It comes from a lot of experience, really. A lot of shared vocabulary. That too, yeah. And as composers, as, in addition to being improvisers, we're composers as well. I think of myself sometimes as a spontaneous composer. Right. But uh, often, one of the things I'm trying to achieve in my music is that you can't tell the difference between what's written and what's improvised. It's all just coming from here. <laughs> right. So let's try it again for them. What do you think? Okay. Hang on. <laughs> experiment because this is exactly what goes on in a recording studio. Uh, first take, second take, third take. Right. They're yeah. like snowflakes. <laughs> and you know, it's interesting, uh, jazz musicians who have spent a lot of time recording um, have developed, I think, all kinds of techniques um, for keeping their ideas fresh, for um, trying to put themselves in the most creative frame of mind, uh, and a lot of it has to do with relaxation. Right. Uh, often the minute you start to think, I've got to be perfect, or I've got, there's a solo idea that I had and I must do, that's the minute Forget the solo it. goes down the tank. That's right. Um, and it happens in succeeding takes, like in the first take, especially if you listen to it back, but sometimes you can just remember. Oh, I played that one thing that was really good. If you try to put it in the second time, forget it. You can't find a natural place to put it. It sounds stilted. You didn't play it quite the same way. You know, so you can really start, you start second guessing yourself is what happens sometimes. Another technique that I sometimes use, and I remember this explicitly because of, recently I performed a piece at City Center. It was a, a dance piece that involved a uh, jazz quartet, and myself playing soprano, and Carmen de Lavalade was dancing. And we had rehearsed this piece over and over and over again, so much so that we were saying, this thing is over-rehearsed. Uh, when we got to the tech rehearsal, you know, before the performance, I remember saying to Carmen, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a jazz player. I'm just going to not play. You know, I mean, I'm not going to put any energy into this, the solo. I'm going to try to, as we call it, save it. Right. And we went through the tech, and a fascinating thing happened. <laughs> 
um, I decided, I, I did make a decision. I decided I was going to try to just play the simplest thing I could without even thinking about it or worrying about where it was going to go or what it was going to do. And lo and behold, that particular take, it was the, according to my husband, who was the director, was the absolutely best one. And oh I said, I was, tr I was trying to do nothing. <laughs> I was actually taking everything about my head that was trying to tell me what I should do. Isn't that interesting? Off it went. And what felt to him like the most uh, picturesque moment Isn't that was funny? when I was trying to do nothing. The one, but it's also the one that nobody <laughs> in the audience heard. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh, what do you think? Did it sound different the second time? Yes. Much more what? Alto bass. Uh, I don't know. Alto, yeah. Alto. Lower register of the soprano, yes. yes. <laughs> low key, maybe. Literally low key, yes, sir. Have you recorded this piece? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, and when you listen mm -hmm. to it, mm -hmm. ABA, do, art do and you aviation, improvise on what you hear saying, gee, maybe I'll do it a little differently the next time? I mean, does your mind work that way? From the recording? You mean, are you influenced by your recording of right. it? Right. Um, you know, sometimes you can't help but be, especially around the time that you're working on a recording and you're listening to the thing over and over and over mm. again, you can't help it. Uh, but fortunately, th this was two years ago. <laughs> no, no, I, I meant post-recording. In other words, mm -hmm. did you listen to this piece mm -hmm. before no, she you came here yeah. today, knowing no. that you were going to be starting off? No. Not recently. No, no not recently. Okay. Um, I did. Because <laughs> I haven't played it before. Yeah. <laughs> And well, did you play this for the first time? Well, we played it to, uh, to rehearse for this, but it's my first performance of it. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, just in the past couple mm -hmm. weeks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm wondering, the second time through, you seem to arpeggiate the chords more. And I was wondering if that influenced the way Jane played, to, the way you, you responded, the way you played your song. Absolutely, but it's not a conscious thing. It's not, yeah. Mm -hmm. this, is the, uh, this is a subject for, you know, yeah. You know, a three-hour discussion about the unconscious processes that are going on between musicians as right. they're playing. It's, it's not conscious thought like, we th like we're talking. It's something else. Or it's nonverbal thinking. Anyway, mm -hmm. But I'll tell you something, because mm -hmm. this is part of what I think we want to do today, is I'll tell you what went on in my mind. Uh, I think it was mutual, because uh, somehow I just played the first chord, and I felt that maybe Jane took a little longer to play on that first chord. And if, if some words did come into my mind. A lot of musical thinking, you have to understand, is nonverbal. But some, just for a second, some words flashed in my mind. I said, oh, this one's going to be different, you know? And I just kind of got that in my mind and then started to get on a dreamier, even dreamier kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, approach to it. And uh, so it's somehow it's a, like a mutual thing. It's not really that I started it or you started it. But for a second, those words, and the rest of the time, I don't remember thinking words particularly. But that did flash into my mind for a mm -hmm. second. I said, oh, this is going to be different, maybe dreamy, dreamier, you know, or something yeah. like that. If, I think if there's anything that I, I think of ahead of time, it's from my experience in the studio, performing something one right after the other, is that it, it <coughs> cannot be the same. That, if that's a thought that's there, it cannot be the same. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only conscious thing I'm aware of. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about animal farm. You know, all animals are created equal. Only some are more, created more equal than others. <laughs> and you know, so it's kind of like all improvisation is good, but some seems to be better than other. Oh, is there any objective? Are there any objective criteria that would that you can point to that would establish why one improvisation is considered better than another? And is there a range of any kind? Yeah, there's a lot to it. Um, experience. Th think about improvisation as a lot of instantaneous choice making. <laughs> and people who've spent their lifetime doing this, practicing improvising all the time, it becomes, uh, what happens is you hone, you seem to hone things about, you know, which decisions you make. I mean, the, it, the possibilities are endless. But I think uh, as you mature as a musician or as a composer, um, you start to find the choices that are uh, perhaps more 
unique to yourself. <laughs> it's your own vocabulary. Um, a lot of the shoulds and shouldn'ts start going away. <laughs> and often when I talk to young musicians who are stu you know, studying jazz and are so impatient you know, for the better solo, for the improvisation that they wish for, it's, it's a lifelong journey. And it's something that you just get better at the older you get. Yeah. Um, you want to? Very true. Yeah. And uh, I, but I think you were also saying, mm -hmm. how do you decide one take is better than the other, and how do you decide one improviser is better than the other? Because we do have opinions in jazz about who are the really great ones and so forth and so. And uh, I, you know what? I don't like to. I don't like to put that into words. Because uh, t uh, s uh, artistic taste, you know what I mean? That's, that's, there is a gut thing, and then you find the words, is usually what happens, you know? Uh, but in a way, that gut reaction, I think, is maybe more important. And I, I, even though I could, I tend to, and people don't believe this because I write books that say, come on, you can find the words, get out of here. But I, I don't like to, I'd rather not. I'd rather not to, to find that. It's, it's, there are things that feel organic, and they, they work, and they move you. You say, wow. And then there are times when people improvise and go, well, that was a lot of notes, wasn't it? <clears throat> so, um, you know, I don't like to really put it into words, but you do, you have touched on an issue there for sure. There's so many things in it. I mean, we could talk forever about this. Yeah. I mean, that musicians, <clears throat> when they compose or when they improvise, are working with a very important sense of expectation that you have and how we set it up and how we zig when you think we're going to zag. <laughs> right, yeah. And how that's interesting to you and your mind <laughs> and uh, how composers do that and, and improvisers do that too. Right. Uh, I, I just think, yeah. you, I, I speak for myself that as, as I've gotten older I've found more of myself <laughs> uh, in what I play and that feels good. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of the tricky things too, though, because uh, I like to say jazz musicians have big ears. You know, and what I mean is we're interested in everything. You'll hear some contemporary classical thing. Oh, wow! You'll hear some older classical mm -hmm. thing. You'll hear older jazz thing. You know, you'll hear something in pop music. We're constantly hearing things. Jazz is, is maybe the most eclectic music there is in that sense. And even since the early days, that we've been drawing things from classical music and from pop music, and so. It is kind of a, a lifelong search to find yourself because you can be drawn too much to something else. And there are musicians who are known as, you know, uh, the Benny Goodman clone or the Coltrane clone or the Charlie Parker clone. And that's not really, that's not really ideal, you know. That's certainly not what, what Jane and I are, are about. But it's, 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 that's part of the work, I think, is having all those influences and yet having a sense of who you are at the same time, you know. Probably the most valued thing among jazz improvisers is to have a unique voice. Right. More than anything else, if you talk to the older musicians, um, whether you play fast, whether you play slow, whether you play up or down, it's um, an, an intuitive sense that you have found your own voice. That's the thing that is most valued among improvisers. In fact, they, they, a lot of times they give the same example. So Ben Webster, it's a famous saxophone, said Ben Webster would play on a record and after two notes you knew who it was. Exactly. As they always give examples like that. But there, there is a lot of truth to that and a lot of value to that. You know? yeah. we'll drop the needle test. Remember? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah. you want to say something, Francis? Yeah, Francis. How does it compare to the conversation? For instance, like, if I'm going to go to someone's house, I might think, uh, what am I going to say when I open the door? I, and, and then when I get there, I, I may try to uh, repeat what I've had in my mind. When you, when you came here today, I mean, was it set up before? I mean, it's sort of a question about process and extemporization. You also have this in academic settings. Like, so there are people who like to, like to give lectures from notes uh, and read, or read a lecture. And then other people who, like, they'll set the whole lecture up, but then they'll go off mm -hmm. and they do their thing. And it's, it's obviously much more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Well, uh uh, the structure that we have rehearsed uh, is usually what we call the head of the tune. It's right. usually a very small portion. That's the prepared. If, if there's thought about that, that's the thought. Uh, in terms of the word dialogue that goes on among musicians when we're playing, I think a good way to reference this word is it's not dialogue in the sense that you think of it as conversation. 
Hi, how are you? Yeah, mate. Louis, <laughs> I'm doing fine. Right. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> now, it's, it's... It's not um, small um, talk, that's for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, more, it's more that um, improvisers are thinking about the same... Imagine there's this idea that we have about this piece. We're thinking about the same thing, and we're doing it simultaneously. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ornette Coleman, perfect example How of this. How do you know that you're thinking about the same thing? We, you don't. <laughs> it's, we have an idea. <laughs> it's an intuition. Yeah. Of yeah. course, we, we can't be the same. But the, uh, but the fact that we are, have a starting place. Well, for example, the sheet music that we yeah. start with. Yeah. It, it, you know. Yeah, there's kind of a to there's like a kind of topic, but try to imagine that more more like when we're talking, but we're talking over each other. We're talking at the That's same true. time. Because we're talking at the same. It's not time. like hi, how are you? <laughs> he and I are playing simultaneously in time. Exactly. Um, and yet there is something that's going on between us. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's a topic that we know something about, right? <laughs> right? In other words, we're not having a conversation. Of, uh, it's, you know, it's not like uh, we do have this, you know, in this case, you know, this foundation that she wrote, or, and we have experience improvising. So it's not that we're discussing something with no, no knowledge of it. But is, is it all sweetness and light, or do <laughs> improvisers <laughs> compete or challenge or set traps for each other? Is there a more uh, dynamic challenge. tension? I would, well, I would say sometimes it doesn't go well. Sometimes it doesn't go well. I mean, I've, I've had yeah. drummers and bass players that I, I said to myself, I never will work with that person again, mm -hmm. because I felt that they just went in a different direction from where I was going. You know? in, the, in the best group, you know, group personnel of, of groups I've ever been with, it's because the other people spark my imagination with ideas right. all the time. It's like they're coming at me from every direction. That's what I like. But uh, it's, it's always something going on like that. And it's, you're right, it's not always sweet and nice. <laughs> and, there's such a, and there's such a thing as cats who don't listen. And you're playing and you say, gee, I don't feel he or she is listening to me at all. You know, and it, it, it will really bother you. you know? And there's such a thing as people who do listen but have a, an idea of how to respond to you that wasn't really what you would have, doesn't work for you or whatever. You know, so yeah, it's, it's uh, complicated. Uh, yeah. Is there a time when there's a block or you can't, you sort of do the same thing over and over because you sort of lose your ideas? Does that ever happen? Yeah, after take three. <laughs> yeah. After take three, it's like it's all downhill. Um, <laughs> but when you run out of ideas, you know, usually, let me think about that for a minute. Times when you really don't feel like you want to play. <laughs> or the other person, just based on what they're playing, you just sort of can't. Yeah. yeah. Go for me, if I play a tune too much, that happens. Mm -hmm. If I play it at every engagement for a month, and I say, you know what, I better not play that tune for a while. I'm, I'm, I really, am, it's not exciting me. I can't find anything new to improvise on it. You know, that'll happen to me. And uh, people always ask me to play tunes for my mm -hmm. first CD. Uh, which which you is is there today too? Mm -hmm. This is my recent one. But uh, I said I don't I don't want to anymore. I'm sick of them. <laughs> I'm great at publicizing my work, as you can tell. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Nothing wrong with them. I'm just sick of them. Yeah, I play yeah. them too much. Yeah. I have the opposite question. Have you ever played a song once so well that you think I just there's no reason to ever do it again? <laughs> <laughs> You know, sometimes you might think that, but you always do play it again. I, yeah. I can think of instances of a uh, recording of a ballad I did that I said, yeah, that said it, it's done, you know. Right. But uh, I do perform it, the same ballad in performance, and something else always happens. Uh, so you're right, yeah, interesting question. Should we try uh, a ballad now or do my other thing? Or what do you think for our next example? Uh, what do you feel like? <laughs> Ballad. ballad it is. Since you just mentioned okay. she has an arrangement of a ballad. You want to tell them anything about it? Oh, I think they'll know it. Okay. Hang on, let me pull this back.
That was a ballad that I recorded on an album called the Red Quartets. It's one of the, one of the CDs out there. And you, you listen, remember this performance. Check that one out and see, see what you think. It's got to be different. <laughs> it's very different. And what was the name of that? Time After Time. time, after after time. time. <laughs> oh, who wrote that? Uh, oh, Jules Stein. Oh, right. Mm. Yeah. So that's an example of, of taking a familiar song, which is the way, you know, in jazz, we call them standards. You know, we call them standards. But uh, uh, a, a lot of jazz from during, a, you know, about 1930 and still going on, you know, a lot of jazz is based on what we call standards, which now are really older tunes for the most part, you know. Uh, but how did you uh, come up with that arrangement? Because this isn't in Jules Stein's. Mm -hmm. That's not in his music. Where does that come from? Well, th this is me, the composer. Um, you know, the, the American Songbook is, and those songs written in the 30s and 40s have a very special place in my heart and my music. And it's, it's been my point of view that it's really important to try to say something about why I'm playing this song in the year 2007 and not 1940. Right. Um, so oftentimes I'll write an introduction that's a, 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 a little piece of an idea that I, I feel almost is like a, a co-composition. It was inspired by Time After Time and somehow they, they come together and they make sense together. Okay. That's kind of how it happens. And it frames it, it frames it. Mm -hmm. You play it at the beginning, you hear it at the end, and it frames it and gives it a whole different uh, mood. In terms of the balance of improvisation between the two instruments, my sense was that Dr. Porter, mm -hmm. at, in the first part, mm -hmm. was doing most of the improvising, is that rather than having it written down, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. There was a part where I was playing by myself. Yes. yes. That was improvised. Yes. And then yeah. you were improvised. And then, then my question was, mm -hmm. how did you make, you make your decision about when to come in after his solo? Was that something that was part of your arrangement or something you did just then? It was a very good, and, but I'm wondering whether or not you could have chosen to do it earlier, later, and how you made that decision. Often, you know, it, it's tradition that the improviser will take a full chorus of the song. Um, a lot of times, though, myself included, I'll come in, if I hear it, before the, the form has concluded. He was still playing the end of the song uh, as, as I'm merging into my improvisation. Some overlap, some overlap. Um, but when you're playing on this kind of, uh, see, each one has a different foundation. When you're playing on the foundation of a popular song, the song has a certain length, and it's really, as you said, it's kind of tradition that each one goes, uh, you can go once, twice, or however many times through the form, but you do observe the form of the song. Right, but again, in this case, that was a choice that you made mm -hmm. as to when to come in. At that so, moment, it right. felt yeah, right. That's right, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, when I was improvising the last chorus, um, Sometimes when I'm improvising on a ballad, I almost feel like I'm not doing a thing. I'm in my mind is that melody. There is this template of this melody that's going on in my mind as I'm recreating and creating other melodies or whatever it is I'm doing. Um, and it feels to me when it's happening like I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe that yeah. to you. But when it's really, you're in the zone, um, I'm not thinking about, am I putting my, the right keys down? I'm not thinking about the fact that I'm playing a soprano saxophone. I'm not thinking of any of those technical things that you hear. It's, it's when things are happening right, and that felt good to me, <laughs> it feels as if the instrument is disappearing and the voice that's in here and here is, is coming through. <laughs> right, yeah. Other types of jazz, you mean? Yeah, other types of jazz. Sometimes it's a, a, a harmonic progression well, it's like, in your head. Well, like sometimes. in the first one, it was just a series of chords without a, a, an assigned uh, timing. See, that didn't have an assigned timing to it. With this one, we're thinking one, two, three, four. Yeah. 
So that's a difference. Right? There's a lot of different ways. Th this is the most common way to improvise jazz. If you were to do, you know, look at every jazz recording ever made and kind of do a uh, statistical thing, you'd find that a, a high percent of them are, have a steady beat and they're based on the chords of a song. But there are a lot of other things to do. You know, we like to do some different kinds yeah. of things. Lots of questions. Yeah. yeah. Do you find that sometimes you're thinking colors or shapes or that any particular values get triggered by something that other areas of thinking get activated by some, I, I am a visual thinker. Um, so I can't be specific enough to tell you I'm thinking of this or I'm thinking of that, but I, I know I do think of sound in a very sculptural way. Um, I, I don't think I could be a little any more specific. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll demonstrate this in another piece. Okay. <laughs> Which one? The, the, uh, the, the, the Pollock. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So you always start with the two, with the bass, or you sometimes start with your improvisation and have the bass come in later. Uh, decide what to do. Perfect question for the next piece that we're going to play. <laughs> All right, let's get it. Let's do it. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Uh, let me just make some adjustments. So are we doing the, the Pollock then? Why not, yeah. Okay. It seems like a good lead-in. Let me just hear my sound for a second. Okay. Let me see. Let's try to change it just a little. I want to see how that mm -hmm. sounds. set. fast on that one. Thinking, this was a piece <laughs> called quick. Jackson Pollock. <laughs> uh, this isn't the exact canvas that I remember being inspired by. I think it was Autumn Rhythm that I was looking okay. at when I wrote this piece years ago. Interesting. But uh, I did write a series of music inspired by Pollock and recorded it called Chasing Paint. And uh, when the improvisers in the quartet would play this music, Everybody got one of these. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and each of the pieces was based on a different painting, so people had different. And yeah, the musicians really got into it. But it's tricky mm -hmm. because music is a sound art, you know? And you can't, you, so you can't be inspired by it in as specific a ways. 
uh, sometimes people imagine. You know. So for example, I was joking before when I looked in that picture, uh, and Jane showed it to me. I said, I can't tell if that's in B flat or C, <laughs> you know, because it's neither. You know, that's the thing about music. Uh, now, for me, it's interesting, because when you say about shapes and colors, colors, I can't remember thinking. But shapes, yes, but for maybe a reason that you wouldn't think of, it's because the piano is a very visual instrument, and I visualize keys and where, how my hands are on the keys. Sharp, what they call sharp keys, D and E major, let's say, I think of as having sharp corners, because you can see a line, you can see like squarish kind of lines between the, the notes on the hand. When I do a, a key like D flat, if you actually measured it, maybe the lines are still square, but in my mind, those are more rounded. There's more of a circular line to it. So I actually do think shapes, but they're kind of like hand shapes. It's not synesthesia. It's not that. It's something right. else. You yeah. know, it's not that you could think of that and only that. And in fact, there is a book, I don't know if you know this, by a, um, I'm not sure what he is, a cultural Taste, anthropologist or something. Tasting shapes? Oh, oh, oh well, that's the, the oh, synesthesia, okay. but uh, about the hand and the way the hand oh. fits on the piano. It's called Ways of the Hand by David Sudno. You may know, you may know this. And he never did get a job in academia with his doctorate, so he actually teaches pianos. <laughs> that's what he does if you go to his website. But that's a, that book is all about mm -hmm. the feeling of the piano and the, and the hand, you know, which is kind of interesting. What are your thoughts about um, your actual physicality and how it relates to, to what you're playing in the moment? Because you're talking about kind of the way you image your instrument right. as you're playing. But Jane has a you know, very strong physical relationship to the music and to our instrument. And how, how does it relate to the instrument that you're playing on? Yeah. Well, I, I can speak for myself. Um, when I, I always moved when I played, before I even knew that I did. Mm. Um, it's something I just, I don't even think about. It's intuitive, completely intuitive. Um, but over the years, uh, I became more aware of it, and especially with the help of some choreographers and people in dance that I worked with. And uh, this went uh, simultaneous, simultaneously with an interest that I always had in how sound changes when it moves. Mm -hmm. These Doppler effects are... Uh, doing things like that in a room like this, if it had more reverberation, could be sonically kind really of interesting. <laughs> um, but it interests me to, to think about that. <laughs> and uh, as time went on, I found that I was, as I became more conscious of it, I started to integrate it more into my compositions and to more of my thinking as an improviser. So it, the movement actually became kind of a signature part of my vocabulary now. Um, I'm interested in those Doppler-esque kind of pitch shifts. Right. And then I enhance it with some of these live electronics that you're hearing today. It's we, interesting mm -hmm. because there are moments where you can really see that you're moving the music. Mm -hmm. You're using your physicality to, to move the music in a certain way. And then there are other moments when it seems like you're being, mm -hmm. you're being moved by the music. You're kind of yeah. feeling everything. There's a constant mm -hmm. okay. uh, pull, uh, feeling of, of forward and back, uh, of initiating and responding that's going on all the time. And I think that's what you're sensing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, I, I don't have much of a sense of what I look like when I play the piano. I will after I see this DVD. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll be appalled. But um, I know that I move around, that I move my torso a lot, maybe more than a lot of piano players do. I'm mostly self-taught. And I, I, I always say, you know, as long as I get the note, I'm satisfied. You know, I don't have, like, a, necessarily doing things the perfect way. but. Um, you do find that you, you respond. For example, there was a chord in that first one, just to, to go back to that for a second, and it was one of these kind of sounds. And I remember, I, I felt it like this, though, when I played it, it was like, <laughs> it was one of, that's how it felt to me. It didn't just feel like, you know, you pluck, <laughs> pluck the notes down. So uh, you, do, you do tend to be involved physically. There, there are musicians who, who are like sphinxes. Yeah. They don't, you know, that's Charlie right. Parker, if you've ever seen you footage of him, didn't move a muscle. That's right. And yet, the expression of the sound. Exactly. It doesn't mean that you're lacking in any no. kind of expressivity, yeah. but, uh, you know. Yes, sir. Just to go back to the issue of the visual component of our experience of music, which is to say that when you listen to a piece of music, somehow the rising and the falling and following the melody leads 
to somehow shapes in the mind, just as part of the experience. And I'm wondering from the musician's point of view, one is that credible, that there is that visual component, and the musicians sort of have that same almost visualization of the rising and falling and the movement of the music. Absolutely. Because yeah, so. this, this melody, I remember being very conscious, it's not that I'm writing a series of regular eighth notes, boogie, doogie, doogie, doogie. I was writing a melody where things slowed up and, and you know, slowed down, sped up. Um, also, the directionality of where the melodies go up and down. All those things are guiding your ear. Yeah, I think you, you caught it. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I, I know for myself. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because when you're improvising, you know, uh, it's, it's different for the player than from the audience member because we also have to know where to put our fingers if you're a piano player. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so there are, there are technical things that come from experience. And uh, I, I don't really know everything that's going in my mind. As I say, it's mostly nonverbal, but um, I know that I do think shapes of melodies, but I'll also zero in on a specific note to actualize that shape. I may know, for example, after playing a certain line that it needs to be balanced by a descending line. But that's not enough to get my finger to the right note. But sometimes that will come into my mind, a, a picture, you know, kind of a dramatic shape. This has to do with what you were asking me before, too, in terms of why we like certain improvisation. A certain dramatic shape will come into my mind, you know. Um, but there's another aspect, too. We talked about this just a little, which is, uh, Jane, what do you think about a setting like this where we're talking about what we're doing? <laughs> this is very unjazz like <laughs> <laughs> Most, most jazz musicians are not talkers, you know, yeah. are not verbal people, uh, yeah. my experience. And even the, f the act of us talking to you is altering the music. The yeah, fact absolutely. If we had not engaged in this <laughs> dialogue, you know, with, with words with you, something else would have happened. I don't know what, but... <laughs> it doesn't mean it's worse. <laughs> don't worry. But... Uh, it does affect it. I mean, for me, it's funny. And again, because we both teach, you know, it's not like I'm not used to talking. I, I lecture at Lincoln Center. I'm a, it's all this. But uh, when I give an actual concert concert, I always tell them, they say, well, would you talk a little before each tune? The truth is, I'm terrible at concerts. I usually don't even announce the tunes. Those of you who have seen me would know that. And it's because I find that actually talking can be dis distract, distracting or disruptive even, yeah. in a way. Uh, so it's a different experience, you know, plus if you're just playing for an hour, there's, a, there's a, a feeling of warming up and of getting to the next tune. There's a whole other thing here. We're kind of stopping in between. So we wanted to, Jane wanted to bring that up. I thought it was an interesting point that even this setting is something a little different, you different. know, and affects the, affects the playing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it would seem to me that the tune you just played is a very specific example one listening to it could have an extraordinarily different experience of the piece depending on whether or not you showed that, that mm -hmm. image okay. before. Mm -hmm. would, would you talk about that? That's the way I think it should be. <laughs> that uh, although we write music, we, we can never dictate what you're thinking. Nor she, titles are only like titles of poems. They, they only springboards for your imagination in whatever direction your imagination goes. Uh, but you can never tell somebody, this is what this piece is about and this is what you must think. Right. But it would seem that in this case, the title is almost programmatic. If you mm -hmm. announce the title, mm -hmm. you are predisposing the audience to hear it. But I think also in his, in his question, Jane, mm -hmm. is would it be okay if they didn't know that it was about Jackson Pollock? Yeah, it would be fine. <laughs> it would be fine. I think that's what she's getting at. A yeah. uh, famous example, John Coltrane, A Love Supreme, one of the famous jazz albums of all time. And uh, the last movement of it is based uh, syllable by syllable on the poem that's in the liner notes. And he was at, nobody knew this for years, I published about it in my book, but uh, part of the reason they didn't know is that he was asked. And uh, they said in an interview, and they said, uh, there's, I noticed there's a poem in the liner notes. Would, would it be good for the people to know that? <laughs> he said, no, I'm not. Whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> he could have said, what are you talking about? It's based on, <laughs> so you better know it. But he didn't say this. So whatever. You, know, you could know it or not. It doesn't matter. Uh -huh. That's a love supreme. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a modern visual culture that we live in, 
don't you think that our experience of that song would have been totally different? I know I feel it would be. Mm -hmm. Had you shown us the picture before you played the song? You mean if she hadn't shown it? If I had? Well, you didn't show it until it was over. Right. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I forgot yeah. it. Yeah. Had, had I seen that in the beginning? Yeah. You, oh, you might have. You, mm -hmm. or, had you, or had the picture been on the wall, uh -huh. my experience of the, in, uh, of the music would have been highly enriched. I think, well, okay, well, that's a because question. I would, have had, I, would have had, I would have had my, I mean, the way my mind works, mm -hmm. I would have had mm -hmm. a modern master painter as a reference point mm -hmm. for sitting in a room and listening to the two people that have extraordinary reputations in the jazz field mm -hmm. interpret that picture. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like, doesn't get much better than that. Well, that's interesting. I mean, unless you could have brought Jackson back just, you know, <laughs> smiling. <laughs> in an image, you know, you need a modern mystery composer wasn't enough? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but there's well, a value, there's I mean, a value, there's a value judgment in there. You could always make it better, and that would have made it better mm -hmm. for me. There's a value judgment in there. He's saying well, it, it would better, be better or worse. You know? uh, I think your your mind organizes it differently. I I, I would I agree speak, to that. I can only speak for myself. Yeah, sure. But again, mm -hmm. remember the relationship of music to any non-sound world is not it's not very uh, specific, really. So it may be that that would have helped you, but uh, I think what Jane was saying before is, you, you, why is that better? It's just, well, I, it's just it's other. It's, it's just other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's your just. Mm -hmm. Why is that better? A quick question. Based on the song "Time After Time" and the fact now that I know mm -hmm. that you both teach, mm -hmm. do you ever advise your students, obviously not to plagiarize, but to take songs that have become standards, that have become famous, that have, you know, obviously that song was familiar to me. The other two mm -hmm. weren't. I got my own personal entertainment value out of hearing your version of it. But do you advise students to listen to certain standards that have obviously made their mark in the world of music? Absolutely. In, in, that's that's a traditional. That's a traditional music. part of jazz education. So yeah. that's not like out of line. No, no, no absolutely. Be, I'd be astounded to meet yeah. uh, somebody who yeah. studied jazz in school that wasn't said these are some tunes mm -hmm. that everybody really should know. I actually that's teach a, a course where I teach students how to play ballads from the American Songbook of great. this period, this very period. That's great. And, and well, that's playing the ballads. I'm mm -hmm. talking about using the ballads to create their own version mm -hmm. of no, time that's, after time. No, that's really what yes. she means. That's yes, what, that's what they do. Right. In I jazz, we say playing it, but we're never really mm -hmm. always doing our thing with it. No, okay. that's indeed the, the direction of the course. <laughs> you found it. Yeah. Exactly. But we also use different types of uh, foundations. I happen to, uh, I'm sure Jane does too, but I happen to love Indian music and Asian music and uh, as uh, was mentioned in my bio, I'm working with a, an Indian tabla player right now. And there's an Indian scale that goes like this. Uh, I love it. And it so happens they use the same, I pointed this out to the tabla player, that they use the same scale in the uh, gamelan music of Indonesia. So I'm going to put this on a gamelan sound. It's like a metal, uh, almost like a little xylophone or something like that. And we'll play this little theme I wrote. I just call it gamelan because I'm not great with names. You know? <laughs> I'm going to have Jane name all my tunes from now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to give her my CD and say, name, name everything, name. please. <laughs> and quick, because I'm in a hurry. That's it. I need it by tomorrow. But uh, let's try this. Uh, I just call it gamelan.
That's take one. I don't know if we need to take two. <laughs> there was a question back here. Not bad for take. Yeah. Oh, well, there's a lot of different attitudes. And, and, uh, first of all, everybody thinks that their tradition is the greatest one. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, but I guess you've noticed that about human culture anyway, the way human culture is. I'm always astounded by human culture because it's such a powerful force. And uh, it's so different. You can tra even the United States, which are not as united as we like to think, you can travel a few hundred miles and you're in a different culture. You know? Or you can travel a few blocks in Brooklyn and you're in a different culture. And uh, the culture is so powerful, and yet when you think, what is culture based on? It's based on, somebody tell me. <laughs> Why do you believe that if you blow yourself up, you'll go whatever, and go become a suicide? Well, somebody told me that. <laughs> That's the only reason. Culture is based on somebody told you. It's an oral, all culture is really oral in, at its base. And so everybody thinks this is the best. But the great thing about music is there we're dealing with nice stuff. We're not dealing with you know, suicide bombers and things like that. We're dealing with one of the lovely things about culture. And so for example, and, and there's a lot of pride. This is the other thing I find. So for example, people who play traditional Indian music. When I, in uh, 1972, I was living out in San Francisco area and I, I, had, I played in a group, I put a group together with faculty members of the Ali Akbar Khan School of Indian Music. And they were great, they were very open. They loved it. As soon as I said, I'd like to, I'm a jazz pianist, I'd like to play with you. Ooh, great, let's do it. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> I didn't expect, I didn't have to convince them. But on the other hand, they were very proud of what they played and how they played it. Let me show you what we do, and this is how we do it, you know. So uh, it's fascinating. I love being involved in different kinds of music traditions, you know. Yeah, by, my, go ahead. My, I have a second question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you to say something about that. <coughs> my second question is, have you, have you taught people? She said, you want to say more about that? Yeah, it's okay, go ahead. Um, my second, have you taught people that have come to you for inhibitions or psychiatric disorders, or you have experiences where it's been therapeutic for somebody where you found that somebody's changed because of studying and improvisation? Well, uh, not, for, not in the technical sense. I don't know if you're a psychologist. But uh, in the school, in the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music where I teach, often I find a lot of young people are drawn to this music um, and often mistake a lot of things that are inside the improvisation tradition for things that they have problems with mentally. <laughs> uh, a lot of um, times, uh, the nonverbal thing was something we talked about. A lot of times, um, self-esteem and uh, confidence have an enormous right. amount to do with the growth of a beginning improviser. Um, and it, it's interesting, as a music teacher, you see it come out in all kinds of ways. Um, but we only talk in the language of music. Uh, but I, I have to say, in all honesty, I have observed it, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yes, sir. I think Dr. Porter said that the scale of the piece you just played on was really a scale which wasn't a scale of Western music, it was a scale of Eastern music. That's right. So my question is whether or not by way of improvisation, does that require you to both mentally and technically adjust as opposed to just an, another piece of jazz or improvisation of another piece of American or Western? Absolutely. Okay. An improviser uses a composition as a springboard for your imagination. And you, you uh, someone asked before, can you play anything? N the, the written music informs the choices that you make and uh, the compositional choices that you make, even as a spontaneous composer, it informs them. There would be things that would be inappropriate or just might not sound good or, or would be funny, you know, in the middle of that piece if we went, yeah. oops, you know. Or if I... You know, so, oh, I mean, it could be fine or it could be, wait a second, you know. It's not, it's not very gamelan, you know. But... Um, but I, it raises another issue because uh, there is the issue of uh, the connection between emotions and music. This is kind of a big one. But I have a thing about that, Jane, because jazz musicians always like to say, hey man, I play the way I feel. I play the way I feel. You know, you could come one night and I'm going to play that piece and you could come the next night. It'll be totally different. Well, then you actually go see the person and one night they play. And the next night they play. 
said, wait a second, it wasn't so... <laughs> it wasn't so different. And they just gave this whole lecture, you can tell if my baby left me. You'll be able to tell if my... I couldn't tell if a baby left you, your dog left you. I don't know what you... I can tell if you got a new dog. I don't know what you're talking about. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I made this for a reason, because it's, like, it's a very simplistic idea about the relationship between emotion and music that people don't get. The actual relationship... Uh, has something to do with what Jane said. It's like an actor with a script. And if, if you are so uh, overwhelmed by your emotions that you, that you really have to only play whatever happened to you that day, you'd never be able to go through a list of tunes at the gig. There'd be one tune you'd be in the mood to play. <laughs> Seriously, think about it. That's a, that's a misconception that the common person has. Mm -hmm. Nobody here is common, of course. But uh, <laughs> that's a misconception that they have. That it's, yeah. it's, there's this one, you come to the gig with one mood, and that's the mood you play all night because your baby left. No. Every, no matter what happened to you that day, when, when uh, Jane says we're going to play this particular piece, I said, okay, let me think now. I'm, that's where I'm going to go now. And it's, it's really like an actor with a script, you know. Yeah. What about channeling the emotional content of the piece itself as opposed to putting your own emotional state into it? Well, what do you think? That's a good question. I would say yes. Yeah, very much so, because uh, like this Gamelan one, the, the, the minute you think of it, it, it puts you in a certain mood. You say, okay, I, it's kind of, there's kind of a mood to it, you know, that you want to get into. Well, everything about it's intellectual. Yeah. Learning to play these instruments is is to make it sound like like it's not a big deal is is a big deal. <laughs> Your mind is working very hard the yeah. whole time, and I always like to say that people don't get it because uh, there's some discussion about you know when you, you you don't think anything when you're improvising, but but people don't. This is another thing since you're professionals, most of you that, uh, that to the lay person thinking means words. If there's no words in your mind, you're not thinking. Nonverbal thinking is very intense thinking, I guarantee you from experience. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but, um, so there's a lot of thinking going on. It's, it's a highly intellectual process. And of course, practicing is very intellectual. Practicing, a lot, a lot of, to practice, great, you really have to break things down. A lot of down. great musicians, uh, jazz musicians, are very, very thoughtful people. Yes. Uh, there's one uh, personality that you may see in public. Um, if you actually are peop you know, musicians who work with them, you'll find that musicians are often very much the kind of people who are interested in ideas. And off it, everybody's got a different thing they're interested in, but yeah. um, it's not entirely what you think. <laughs> yes. We have a, another piece. I just want to get to it because it might relate to this, and then we'll have another 10 minutes for questions. But it might relate to this because you have a pre-recording mm -hmm. uh, that we need to play against, and that brings a mood with it, that brings a mood with it, because it's pre-recorded. Uh, so we'll tell Miguel to put this on once we give him the uh, Yeah, we signal. need Miguel to put yeah. on the tape. Louis, I just want to say this last piece you did was far out. I mean, they, they talk about emotion, all whispering back here, and there's something explosive about doing something like that. It just happened. This last thing you just did, Which thing? You really oh, like it, one. that's what you're telling yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You'd love, this, you'd love this group I'm playing with. It's yeah, really yeah. something. Yeah. It's so fun. Okay.
duet version of a piece called Most Distant Galaxy. This was a little portion of a piece of music that I was commissioned to write for NASA. Uh, and uh, so is there a picture with that this gentleman wants to know? Not a picture, but you know what? The a small step for me. <laughs> <laughs> One giant leap for music. Ah, okay. When I was part of that NASA art program, um, the head of the art program used to send me press releases of new uh, interplanetary intergalactic findings. Oh, and really? I remember I got a press release at that time. It was like 1980-something, 89, 88, of one of the most distant da galaxies ever detected. I guess that must, must oh, have been the Hubble. Okay. But uh, that spurred this to happen. Interesting. <laughs> now, there were more questions before mm -hmm. we uh, went into that. Yes, sir. When you, when you play a piece without any improvisation at all, how, how much like or not like is that to, to improvise? When you make an interpretive piece, yeah. but don't improvise. Um, way, way different for me. Um, uh, for example, uh, I, I love classical music. I play it for, for myself, you know. I'm not going to trouble you. But um, <laughs> I did when I was... Uh, in college, I, when I say I'm mostly self-taught, I had three years of piano lessons, and I did have, uh, at the end of each year, you had to play a little recital, you know, in college. And um, I found, for me, see, but this is interesting, because I'm an improviser, it was much more nerve-wracking to play written music, because uh, I'm not choosing the, the, the pitches, you see what I mean? I'm not choosing the notes, and I could actually hit a wrong note. But when you're improvising, you're in control of the choices. It's not that you never hit a note that you regret, but uh, you're in control of it. It's just a different feeling. For me, for me it's nerve-wracking. I would, ex I would ex describe it that way. Obviously not for classical musicians, I hope. Uh, I, I think I've found in playing uh, you know, completely notated music that one of the things over time that happens, just like the improvising, is that even though I'm interpreting, 
somebody else's music, that it becomes uh, more, even in the interpretation, I could not be anything but the voice that I am. I, in other words, your individuality, it can't help itself. <laughs> Even uh, some musicians, even, even if you tried to sound like somebody else, you couldn't do it. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's important too. Yeah. Is you, you should bring yourself to it. <laughs> you know, uh, one thought I remember back on that conversation, I wanted to remember this, the conversation about what goes on in your mind, uh, uh, the verbal and the musical. Often it's very common, uh, musicians, and I've ta you know, we've talked to a lot of musicians, improvisers, when you step off the bandstand after you've had a particularly energetic uh, set of music, nobody can remember anybody's name. I mean, I, could, uh, I can step off the bandstand, I'll look at somebody I know absolutely well, and I know this person like the back of my hand, and I cannot think of the name. That's true. I've, I met, I'm sure many yeah. artists experience this in different contexts. Is it? Why is it? Uh, I don't know. We have to get the exhaustion. neurologists in here. <laughs> For me, it's a kind of very healthy feeling exhaustion. It's like you've just used, because it is intellectual too, you've just used your brain at its most, you've been thinking so hard and so fast and using your physicality and your experience and your creativity. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I love about improvising music is it really uses every, everything. And there's a kind of a, a state of healthy exhaustion is the way I There's also it. something right. about being in an alpha state, you know, a completely concentrated place that I think uh, athletes could relate to this, uh, other performers could talk to you about this. It's, there's something that goes on uh, in this nonverbal process of making music that... I've heard writers describe yeah. it too, when they're in a yeah. zone of writing. I can <clears throat> see that, yeah, I'm sure. Very hard to switch modalities. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's not all time. <laughs> no. <laughs> not yet. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks <Yes>. anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel great now, thanks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, jazz musicians tend to be very thoughtful people, mm -hmm. but you also said that jazz listeners usually are not very verbal. I think you said. Let's talk about the musicians. The musicians I was talking about. No, but you said the musicians are very verbal. No, uh, no, no, no. 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 Like yeah. Let's review. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love the jazz. Yeah. yeah, I love the jazz community. I love jazz people. Most of my friends are jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that they're very bright, very interesting, thoughtful people. Uh, they vary in terms, as Jane was saying before, in terms of how much they want to talk specifically about make, how music is made. Mm -hmm. Some are like, oh, no, I don't want to ruin it, or I don't even know how to talk about it. And uh, others will like to get very specific. Uh, I find musicians, uh, uh, the one way that you see the difference in terms of feedback. Some, some musicians, you could have a really one of those great experiences and you get off and say, yeah, man, see you next time. And others will say, yeah, I really liked it when you did that and when I played this. You know, you, it's, people vary in terms of how much feedback you get. If you're on the too. road with most musicians, they will love talking about all of their other interests other than music when they're, they're backstage. They, won't, they don't want to talk about you, know, right. whether it's yeah. sports, whether it's... Uh, archaeology, or right. Bobby Previtt likes to talk How about the right? Renaissance. <laughs> I, um, I'm sorry. Yes. I no. This is very different mm. from classical musicians today. I don't know if they've been forced into this mode of lecturing and talking about music all the time to audiences. They never used to do it in the 19th century, the 18th century, but now yeah. they do it all the time. Well, your point is well taken. I always think of that because Arthur Rubinstein, one of the famous classical pianists of all time, and they asked him in an, in an interview that's on a DVD somewhere, they said, so uh, you're a Chopin specialist. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So tell us, you know, you know probably know more about Chopin than anybody. And he's born in 18, you know, 90 or something like that, or earlier, maybe 1870. And they said, so uh, what can you tell us about Chopin's music? Oh, oh, he said, it's, it's like perfume. <laughs> I said, I could have done that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that was, that was more like a jazz musician. It was like not, not so really verbally helpful, you know. But, uh, but I think conservatory training lots, is much lots more Lots of abstractions. Oriented. Lots of abstractions. In, in jazz language. Yeah. Things that, are, that don't have a lot of specificity. Exactly. 
But maybe can the classical conservatory mm -hmm. training, I know, for example, I've sat in on chamber music rehearsals. Yeah. Maybe when you've worked with chamber music, mm -hmm. then you find, they go, oh, wait a second, now on the third beat of measure three. The errata three. on page four? Exactly. Yes, 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 right there. <laughs> and and the they'll really get into like the third beat. Don't you think that third beat should be a little louder? <laughs> And I said that beat was over by the time you finished talking about it. <laughs> no, what is going on no, here? But in no. all, in all, all, all fairness, Lewis, the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the focus of the attention oh, on notation and, and where it goes is, exactly. is, a, is a world. It's a symphony to itself in yes. classical music. So it's a different world. No, yeah, it really is. It's a different world. They rehearse a lot more than, than jazz people do. Yeah. It's really true. <laughs> Jazz people are like, are we going to rehearse for this gig? <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. I'm serious. One rehearsal at most. Most That's professionals, right. one rehearsal at most. Are we going to rehearse for this gig? Very unusual. The go, several and rehearsals. And I'm not speaking of rehearsing. I go, maybe it doesn't matter. What the hell? You know? <laughs> We're improvising. You know? <laughs> yes. So, touching on what you've been describing in terms of that difference between the mm -hmm. classical and the jazz, um, Maybe some of your students or some of the colleagues you improvise with are coming from a, a rigid training background. How do you how do you bring them across or crack through that? That's a tough one. Because they're coming to you and they're desirable to you because of what they actually do, but you want to bring them into an environment of improvisation from a classical music training. Yes, yeah, so that's very. What cool. is your strategy or? Well, exercise or some way to, mm -hmm. to bring them across. I've, I've seen it mostly in terms of a lot of uh, Asian students, uh, particularly pianists who come to the school to study improvisation. Often their training has been as classical pianists. But you know what the first thing must be before anything can happen is they must want to. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's the desire. When you feel that desire from them, often one of the first things, because it's because the idea of improvising is so exciting to them because they have felt restricted in, in the classical world. That's the jumping off place. Can't begin without that. <laughs> it's a very mm -hmm. good point mm -hmm. because sometimes, uh, I very often have run into classically trained mm -hmm. musicians who say, yeah, I, would, I think it would be kind of fun to improvise. That's not enough of a motivation because it's not so easy. That's what they don't realize. And I have found a lot of problems. It's, it's actually very hard for classical people, partly because they assume that, that learning the Beethoven is the hard part and the improvisation is going to be the easy part. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Itzhak Perman mm -hmm. has tried improvising on the violin. Uh, here's one of the great classical musicians. You ever heard him improvise? He's okay. Mm -hmm. He's okay. Mm -hmm. That's all. He'd be okay in one of our classes. Mm -hmm. And it's not because he doesn't have musical ability. It's because improvisation is its own discipline and it's mm -hmm. not easy. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thrilled that he's doing it. I'm mm -hmm. thrilled when I see classical people do that. Mm -hmm. But it's extremely difficult, mm -hmm. I find. They were improvisers. Yeah, that's not the training. But that's not the training they're getting anymore. That's the problem. They're yeah. not getting that training. Yeah. I'm not sure how that is related to jazz improvisation. Well, yeah, it's a different kind, but it would help if they had that. They're not getting the training, and I think it's a shame, because that, that was a great training. It used to be expected that you could say, I'm talking about the 1800s, it's a little before my time. But it used to be expected that you could say uh, yeah. for your recital at the end of this, uh, you, uh, we're, yeah, you'll play these pieces, but we're also going to give you a theme and you'll do a set of variations on it. You know? So uh, that kind of training is great. It's not, it's not done anymore, which is a, a real shame, I think. Yes? The players of early music are getting that training. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Music, they they are. Continue, particularly the keyboard exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, but the 19th century composers, and you pointed this out, we're also doing it. Supposedly, um, Chopin's friend said he was a much, much better improviser than he was. <laughs> no chater. That exactly. He was a no chater. The variations were far superior was to, to the pieces written down. Mm -hmm. So we have to cry about that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> we're about out of time. Um, I'm not sure of the time. Uh, Are we we're out of time. We're about out of time. Yeah. We have time till 4.30? Okay. Oh, is that right? Great. Well, then we could play my blues, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's the other piece. All right. Um, we have uh, one other piece, which is uh, uh, f fairly traditional. It's just a, a blues. I call it a blues. Uh, the blues, as you probably know, it's a, it's a uh, African American type of song, and it's a, a very important part of. Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, focus of jazz improvisation. Take a blues uh, chord sequence and improvise on it. 
And I don't, I, I tell you I'm not good at naming my pieces. I've written a bunch of blues over the years and they all have the same name. They're all, they're all, they're all called Lou's Blues. So uh, this is the latest Lou's Blues, I guess you could say. Let me just get a sound, let's see. So it goes, I'll just vamp a little bit. It's one, two, one, two, three, four. That one does a repeating sequence of chords like on time after time. You know, you have this. You heard me do that a lot. It's a repeating sequence underneath it. And that's, so in that sense, it's the, it's the same uh, <clears throat> kind of structure as, a, as the standard song because you have this sequence of chords that goes around and around. And a melody that's just based on a few notes. Yeah. But it's where... 
like Wayne Shorter said, it's how you scramble them. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's <laughs> There's right. a lot of eggs, but it's how you scramble them. That's, that's right. They did say that. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the blues, as I say, that's a, a big part of jazz. That, that's a, an awful lot of, of jazz is based on mm -hmm. some variation of that. Uh, it's the part blues of the, idea. the common vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, there's an enormous amount of vocabulary that uh, jazz musicians share with one another. It's part of you, your training, just like learning to play your instrument, is knowledge of, of music, of reference points to other great musicians before you, exactly. to uh, things that are, uh, what would you call them? Uh, um, cliches? Or not, not exactly, <laughs> not licks, but... Uh, uh, conventions, conventions of how uh, we didn't do one, but you know, there's something called trading fours, right. where you play four, I play four. You know, th these are four things measures, that are back and four forth. measures. This is uh, again part of your. In common fact, knowledge. there's blues, mm. so you wouldn't think this because mm. blues shows up. There's blues in that most distant galaxy piece that we played, <laughs> yeah. because while she's playing, there's one of the one of the written ideas is. Uh, <laughs> Which isn't so different from my theme. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Might as well throw it in there, you yeah. know. <laughs> so this blues shows up everywhere. It's a very important part of the jazz vocabulary since the beginning. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Since the beginning, jazz started in the early 1900s, and the early repertory included blues yeah. songs. That was there in the beginning. Ragtime was the, uh, another big chunk of it, and yeah. popular songs. Well, and being being a saxophone player, uh, the, the composer Percy Granger used to say. It was uh, the saxophone that he loved. He was an American composer because it came closest to the human voice. Oh, that's and, and, you know, some cellists like to say that, too. And <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But being a saxophone player, I, I've always felt that this instrument was my voice. I, I played alto. Once made a, a foray into baritone, but it just physically wasn't my instrument. The alto, I was never able to get feel as if my voice could come through that instrument. Somehow it came through this one. Right. It's interesting how that, the instrument finds you. Yeah. yeah. Winston? Yes. Well, oh, yeah. Yes. You have to, to be a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. You have to. Yeah, yeah he improvises mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, he plays classical music as well, mm -hmm. but uh, he's, he plays mm -hmm. plenty of jazz. Yes. Uh, a gender question. Yes. Or are we that? Mm -hmm. uh, is there still a lot of jazz music that is prejudiced in terms of who's playing what instrument, in terms of uh, you know, men versus women playing certain instruments? <coughs> Succinctly, yes. <laughs> yeah, there is. And uh, if there were a profession where I could say that in terms of the direction that women and what they have achieved, um, the jazz world and its reception to women, I would call absolutely Neanderthal. Uh, Unfortunately, it's, it's yeah. true. If you look in the classical world, um, uh, symphony orchestras, conservatory students, uh, the, almost maybe they are half uh, women now or uh, close. I mean, look at the not, New York Phil. Yeah. Yeah, look at the pictures of the New York Phil. I yeah. mean, not that it was always that way. You know, mm -hmm. so, uh, symphony orchestras weren't open to women being members of the orchestra until roughly. Well, I know that Stokowski, who was great, I thought he was marvelous, he was a leader in so many things, he had an orchestra. In the late 60s, he called the American Symphony that included women, and that was considered way out that he had women in his orchestra. So it's a fairly recent thing. But in jazz, uh, I mean, uh, I have about eight or nine new graduate students every year. And some years there's no women, some years there's one or two women. And that's, that's very typical of, of jazz pro, uh, uh, programs. You know. it's, it's it's some some combination of things, yeah, exactly. They're some they're in 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 all honesty, they're they only yeah. I thought they recently opened up. Oh, is that it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. There are more. You know, as time I in my career, I have seen it get better. <laughs> yeah. If if you had asked me in 1976 when I I was coming out of college, if um, Women would still be having the trouble getting work, playing all the all the instruments. You know, in the year 2007, I never would have believed that uh, it wouldn't be completely, you know, not a non-issue by right. now. Yeah. And and yet it still is. And so still. How, do you this? how come the symphony was so much more liberated? Except for Vienna. <laughs> no, I think they have uh, yeah. finally started accepting them, but very few. They play yeah. beyond the screen. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
What jazz instrument is a part of the mitzvah? Brass, drums, <coughs> bass. Horns uh, yeah. There are only a, a few horn. of those in the field, so mm -hmm. I mean, that's still a little. I mean, I, I'm sure it's very complicated. I'm sure there are social, cultural issues, whatever, because as, as I was saying, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's even the number of uh, young women who are going into jazz. But there is something about the jazz field. It's, it hasn't been so welcoming for women. And still a lot, uh, I don't know how much of the work, but, but Jane, isn't still at least a, a chunk of the work that women get are at these you know, women's festivals, or we're fe look, we're featuring women today, you know, this kind of thing. It's true. The fact yeah. that uh, Billy Taylor is still running an annual Women of Jazz, Women in Jazz Festival in D.C., right. the reason he's doing it is because he believes in these women, and these women are not getting enough opportunities to perform, and this is a way to call attention to them. Um, uh, so the problem still exists, yes. Yeah, very much so. Do you, do you have any thoughts about um, why jazz culture, the music form and the culture that surrounds it uh, engenders or attracts people of certain personalities so that it's actually historically kind of been closely linked to drug culture. And obviously classical music you would probably not say that about, but so many of the jazz greats have been known to have uh, some kind of really strong relationship with the drug culture. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to get the neuroscientists in here because it may be that the that there are chemicals that get released in the brain uh, that have to do with a, a high of creativity, a high of, of, of uh, invention, imagination, that is very similar to the area where uh, drug enjoyment is. Right. <laughs> but also think about the other cultures that are uh, mm -hmm. drug-oriented, the, the beat poets, rock musicians. You know, it's, it's not only jazz, not that, you know, not that we're involved in this, but uh, it's not only, but we do know people. And, and in the past, in the past there was a lot more of it in my experience, but it still does go on. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, so there are other cultures where you see that too, you know. It seems like a, uh, the relationship with the audience is kind of more intimate and in that it's more emotion-based music in, in some way relative to classical music where there's a little bit more of a distancing thing. And I wonder if it's the intimacy that that stirs up something in the musician. I see what you mean. It's a thought. It never occurred to me, but... Mm. It's yeah. possible. Chamber music is very intimate. Chamber music yeah. is very intimate. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot, of, a lot of classical musicians would argue that point strongly, mm -hmm. that it's absent emotion. Yeah. I think you also no, 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 not unemotional, mm -hmm. just the kind of... The, the, the physical, way the audience physical proximity? The chamber, the chamber, the chamber music. Right. But you also can't ignore the, the, the social and cultural <laughs> exactly. view in which in the clubs, the club. A lot of the African American musicians came from communities where drug use was a problem already. So you know that's uh, that's that's part of it. There's economics and politics. Everything's tied up in that. You know, very much. Interestingly so. enough, some of the older black musicians I worked with, playing music for them was a way to get out of poverty. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> and yeah. it may be that the drugs still pulled on them, but it was really music that was their way out of it. <laughs> Just a little bit of historic, just a little bit of historical thing. You know, w. C. Handy likes to say, uh, W. C. Handy was one of the first, first people to publish blues sheet music, so he wasn't an originator. He did say himself he got it from listening to uh, folk performers, African American folk performers, and in, it, we now know that there were a uh, few blues, not many, but a few blues pieces, printed music published before Handy. Uh, but he actually thought and legitimately thought during his own day that he was the first. It's only research found out there were these obscure publications that go back to about 1904. That's before Handy. Yeah. Um, is there a rate of drug use among people who are the composers rather than the performers? I mean, jazz, of course, would be covered both of you. The performer is also the composer. Whereas in classical music, um, very few of the performers are actually composers. Right. So possibly... Hmm. Interesting thought. Ne never thought of that. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. More intensity yeah. involved when you're worrying about your composition mm -hmm. than when you worry about somebody else's composition that you're interpreting. I don't know hmm. where to throw that at. On a gut level, I'd say, if anything, it's the other way around, because okay. uh, most of the jazz people I can think of who are primarily composers no, I know. Uh, uh, have not been uh, drug-oriented. Yeah. Have not been drug oriented. Yeah, is it just an assumption? 
option that um, the, in the jazz field they're more drug users versus classical? I mean, is it just something that we assume? Perceived. I mean, yeah, perceived that that's uh, There was a book out recently that, that debunks that idea that shows ter a great deal of drug misuse in, in the classical world. Yeah. That's so that's true too. Yeah. That's true too. It could be just something that's not as known. Yeah. Right. Well, maybe they. I mean, look. Most people use drugs responsibly. Yeah. So jazz right. has reputations for the few famous ones who did. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's you know maybe maybe people mm -hmm. at classical music will do. The the ones that are alive today are the ones that found their way through it. Right. You know, yeah. from that generation. From that generation. You have to admire them. <laughs> In terms of personality tests, though, I was wondering about when you compare the classical where. It's more structured and more rigid if, you know, with jazz, someone chooses jazz because there's that freedom involved. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah no I question about it. <laughs> most jazz people would say that. Yeah. They, they love the freedom involved. Yeah. Even though you may be working with a certain structure, but you have so much freedom uh, to do mm -hmm. something with that, you know. Or you can work without a structure. Should we do that for a second, just to wind things up and then we'll call it a day? Okay. I don't think we need to go all the way. We'll just play, make something up and then we'll call it a day. How does that sound? Yeah. <laughs>